that uh, you did a little bit of chemistry boot camp with uh, Tom's in those three weeks before I was here. You talked about a little bit about ions, polyatomics. Mm -hmm. So some of this is going to be reviewed today. Did you talk about how to name things? Yeah. Okay. So next week's lab is going to be a paper lab that's basically just going to be a giant packet of nomenclature practice. Okay. It's going to be really boring. But when you're done with it, you should never have to worry about how to name these things again because it will be so drilled into your brain. Um, nomenclature is one of those things where there's really no, uh, no way around it. It's just the easiest and the most effective way to really get it down is just through mind-numbing practice. Um, you should be waking up in the middle of the night thinking about naming compounds um, when we're working on these because it's just it's so much practice. So um, the good news is that, that that's not, it doesn't take, uh, we're moving away from sort of the mind-blowing quantum concepts that are really hard to wrap your head around and just moving into some, into some stuff that has some really straightforward basic rules. So this should feel a little bit easier, even if there's more. It might feel like busy work, um, but trust me, it's not. It's just to make it so that you don't have to think about it um, as much again. Um, and we'll talk about polyatomics today too. Um, specifically, um, we're going to do, let's set it for, uh, a week, so today's Friday, right? So we'll do a week from Tuesday. We'll do another in-class quiz on polyatomic ions. Um, so there's a list that's in the, the slides today, and we'll talk about them and, and get some practice with them today. And then the, the um, packet of nomenclature practice next week, we'll have lots of, um, of practice with those for you to get them down. There's some links to some, um, uh, some Quizlet flashcards, or you can make your own flashcards for the polyatomic ions. Um, and that's really going to be the, the bulk of the memorizing for this class. We've got the periodic table down now. So yeah. once we get the polyatomic ions down, then we don't really have to do any blind recall anymore once, once we're done with that. So that should be a good thing. Because uh, I don't know about you, but I didn't. I never really liked memorizing things. I guess that's not exactly true. It felt like an easy way to do things, but it was boring. So we'll get into more interesting things once we're done with the memorizing. Uh, there we go. All right, let's do a practice atomic mass question. So this is a, this word problem mentions that there's um, if you have different sources, you can have a different atomic mass for different materials because you're going to wind up having different natural abundances depending on where you get certain materials. Um, this is also really true astronomically. Different parts of our solar system have different natural abundances for the elements. So our atomic masses on the periodic table, those are all based around being on Earth. Mars has different ratio of isotopes than, than Earth does. So you would actually use different atomic masses if you were doing calculations on Earth or in the outer solar system or in a different, different star system entirely. You would, you would have very mm -hmm. different, not, some of them might be similar. Um, and here's one example is that, um, the uh, nuclear waste from various from various military applications has different ratios. So you might notice that, um, or so if you look up here at lithium six versus lithium seven, naturally occurring minerals are 7.5% lithium six and the rest lithium seven, but this military source, it's 3.75% lithium six. Now that's, that's part of that enrichment process. If you've ever heard the, the phrase um, enriching uranium, specifically means changing the nuclear or the natural abundance ratio so that you have more of certain isotopes um, because different isotopes can be used for say a nuclear power plant versus a nuclear bomb. And lithium is very similar. Lithium is used uh, in military applications as part of thermonuclear weapons. So fusion bombs um, use 
use lithium as part of their fuel source and lithium seven specifically. So here is a specific source where you have half the amount of lithium six. What's the atomic mass going to be for that source? How do we set up this problem? If we only have two isotopes. Oh, we just put like the percentage times the. Yeah. Num the number like above it. So it'd be like 3.75 times six, right? Exactly. So our generic form of writing it looked like this, where you had our, our mole fraction of an isotope times the mass of that isotope, and then we just add them all up together. Right? If we only have two isotopes in our sample, this is really straightforward. We did the example from the homework from um, earlier this week had three isotopes in the same sample. So it was a little bit longer of an algebra problem. It's the same exact thing. So our atomic mass in this case is going to be mole fraction of lithium six times the mass of lithium six plus mole fraction of lithium seven times mass of lith lithium seven. So we know that our mole fraction of lithium six is 3.75%, which is 0 0.0375 as a decimal. And our mass of lithium six is 6.01512 AMU, if we're being careful with our units. And then if we only have two components and we have one percentage, what do we know about the other percentage? It's 100 minus that 3.75%, right? So 96, so 0.9625. If I did my arithmetic right in my head, I think I did, times seven point. 016. So in this one, we don't even need to do any, I said, I wrote minus, but it should be plus. Um, this one, we don't even have to do any algebra, right? Once we know how to set it up, this is just arithmetic. And we should get something just a little bit under seven. I think if we, if we plug all this in, right? So probably something more like uh, 6.97, maybe. What do we get? Yes, here's the other thing to consider here. What about sig figs for this one? This is one of those tricky ones because we have addition and multiplication in the same problem. So how do we tackle sig figs? One at a time. Let's do our multiplication first before we add them. And we're gonna round when we, so this will keep, we'll keep three sig figs here and four sig figs here. So then we'll, when we add them, we have to switch to keeping the uncertainty the same. So let's see what we get. 0.978. 0.978. 6.9789. Oh, what's the full answer? Six point nine seven. Okay, let's. Why don't you give me just? I don't see those calculators. It's almost usually us out here, so I'm gonna rely on on you all to actually do this. What is this piece? That's zero point eight two four eight two five five percent. So two two six. We're only going to keep three sig figs because this is multiplication, so we count three sig figs, right? Thank you, Macy. And then on this side, we've got four sig figs, but we're going to have a number in front of the decimal point. So this one's also going to go to the to the thousands place, right? So it'll be six point seven five three. So seven five three. Perfect. 
So we rounded to three sig figs, we rounded to four sig figs, and now we're doing our addition, which means we're going to keep it to the same decimal place. And it happened to work out that they both have their decimal places to the thousands for both of them. Teacher, students, have any interruption with Brendan? Please go to circle page. Brandon, please circle. Right. So then 6.9, I think 7, 8 was what you said before, yeah. Brody. And actually, it's going to be so 979 nine now because of the rounding. That's how we make sure we keep our, the right number of sig figs for these. It's an extra step that you have that to write these down instead of just plugging it all in your calculator, but that makes sure that you get your right sig figs. All right, any questions on atomic mass, the rounding, any of this? Feeling pretty good about these right now? So that's called, that's a capital sigma, which if you're, if you're more, if you're better at writing it out, uh, it looks kind of like a sideways M. Um, it just means you're going to add up a bunch of pieces. So we use that when we're going to be adding a bunch of things in this indefinite number of them. So in this case, there's only two isotopes. So we wound up with two terms. If there were three different isotopes, we'd have three terms. It just means to do a bunch of adding. All right. Then let's go ahead and move on. Let's talk about ionic compounds a little bit. All right, so we learned from periodic table and in in electron configurations, we learned how to predict the charges on ions, right? So if we wind up with a mixture of ions where some of them are positive and some of them are negative, what naturally happens is that positives are attracted to negatives, right? And so if positives are attracted to negatives, you wind up with them forming ionic compounds where you just wind up mixing these ions together in the right ratio so that their charges add up to zero. All right, so, and there's a little issue here with the, with the spacing. So calcium and oxygen, we can look at calcium and oxygen and we can predict what their charges are going to be just by from the periodic table, right? What's the charge going to be on a calcium ion? Plus two. What's the charge going to be on an oxygen ion? Minus two. So how many of each ion do we need if we want to make them add up to zero? Just one of each, right? So the formula for the ionic compound formed by calcium and oxygen is just CaO. If we have this formula, that's where we, we have for every one calcium ion, there's one oxygen ion. We can actually predict what's called the molecular mass. Because the molecular mass just says, if you take all the pieces, if you have all these different atomic masses from the periodic table, if we wanted to know how many grams per mole this was collectively, well, one mole of this compound is one mole of calcium and one mole of oxygen, right? So our molecular mass for calcium oxide is just the sum of the pieces. So oxygen is 15.999. Calcium is, is it 40.078? <clears throat> So collectively, this entire compound has a molecular weight that's 40.078 plus 15.999, so 56.077 grams per mole. All right, and um, when you talked about atomic mass and moles with Tom's the other day, you talked about how AMU and grams per mole are the same thing, right? Yeah. Yes. Just want to make sure I'm not glossing over that because this is a really useful, AMU is not all that useful. That's what the, the atomic masses on the periodic table are in. 
technically, but that's the mass of a single atom. We never do things in single atoms, so we'll use grams per mole as a more useful unit uh, and use it as a conversion here as we start getting into chemical reactions. All right, sodium and chlorine, what do we get? What's the charge on each of them? Um, negative one plus one. Plus one on the sodium, negative one on the chlorine. So again, that's a one-to-one -one ratio, right? Yeah. And this is one that we know what this is, sodium chloride, table salt. It's really tasty, isn't it? Fun fact about, there's, there's only three tastes um, that are actually hardwired into all humans. All humans, every culture, no matter how you grew up, have the same three tastes um, that are like, that you're sort of programmed to seek more of. Salt. Anybody want to guess what the other two are? Sugar. Sour. Close. No. Fat. Everybody likes fat. And if you put all three of them together, you get something delicious like funnel cake. Mm, so, and it's it's interesting. So you can you can develop other tastes based on your culture and experience as you grow up. But every culture has those three things, and that's because when we were hunter gatherers as a species, those were the three things that we needed in our diet that we couldn't get on a regular basis. So basically, we evolved to not be able to say no to salt, sugar, and fat because when you found a source of those you gorged on it until it was gone and then because it might be a month before you found something like that again it's interesting facts evolutionary biology is really interesting all right how about potassium and sulfur what's the charge on potassium ion minus one plus one, plus one. It lost an electron, so it's a plus one. And who can we blame for that? Benjamin Franklin. It's all Ben Franklin's fault. He hadn't randomly picked the wrong charge when he was doing his fundamental research on electricity. Then we would have, we would arbitrarily say that electrons were positive, and then everything would make sense. That would really make a lot more sense when you start getting into engineering integrals with involved charge and current, because there's always a random negative sign that shows up because of that negative uh, charge. Minus two. So what's our formula going to be? K2S. What's the molecular weight going to be then? Two potassiums to one sulfur. So we just take all the pieces present in this ratio and add them up. So two times potassium is 39, right? 39.998 or so. So two times 39.998 plus grams per mole, plus one times sulfur, which is about 32, right? 32.06. 066. And if you really want to show your work and make it universal, you could put a one in front of that if you wanted to. But mathematically, that's not going to change things. No? 3.098. Thank you. My eyes are not what's, what they once were. That's not true. My eyes have always been terrible. Um, but I used to be able to remember that. All right. So. Adding those together, I think we can all plug that into our calculator, right? We should get something in the ballpark of 112. All right, so if we're now that we're talking about these ions, we also need to talk about the nomenclature a little bit. I'll be brief with that since I've been told you already talked about the, that a little bit. When something from the periodic table has a negative charge, how do we verbally indicate that it has a negative charge. I, we just drop that last syllable or adjust that last syllable. So sulfur becomes sulfide. Um, there's a few irregulars in there, but for the most part, if you see something that ends in IDE, that's gonna be negative charge. All right, so our name here 
for this entire compound is you just say the name, the rules for ionic nomenclature are really straightforward. You say the name of the positive ion, then you say the name of the negative ion. Does anything change about the, the name for positive ions? Nope. No. So what's this compound? Potassium sulfide. Do we need to specify how many we have? Nope. Why not? Because their charges are consistent. If I say potassium sulfide, it doesn't mean we have the same number of potassiums and sulfides, but we know sulfide is always a minus two. We know potassium is always a plus one. So if you know those charges, if I say potassium sulfide, you can get to this formula by looking at those charges. You might need the periodic table handy to be able to do that, at least while you're, you're learning these. Um, but ionic nomenclature is really straightforward for that reason. You just say the name of your ions. What I, what I want you to be careful with with these is I don't want to see di, tri, mono, none of those Greek numerical prefixes for ionic compounds. We don't use any of those. We use them for covalent compounds, for molecular compounds, because those you can combine things in different ratios. But ionic compounds will always be combined in the same ratio. They're always combined in the lowest whole number ratio that gives you a charge of zero. So with that in mind, all you need to do is specify what your ions are. Uh, how do we know if it's an ionic compound or not? The easiest way is one metal, one non-metal. We'll learn that that's not the perfect way to do it because you can actually have an ionic compound with no, not, with no metals in it. But usually that's a pretty good indicator. Because remember that our stair-step line over there between our metals and our non-metals? Metals are kind of defined as anything that wants to give up electrons to become stable. And non-metals are defined as anything that wants to gain electrons to become stable. So non-metals typically are going to have a negative charge when they're when they're an ion, and metals are typically a positive charge. So if you see a metal and a non-metal, that's a pretty good bet that's an ionic compound. For the sake of this class, we'll just say it is an ionic compound. And there's one or two exceptions where you can have no metals and still get an ionic compound, but we'll get there in a minute. All right, so here's just some more examples. Um, and remember that this subscript, so now we have a couple, every time we put a number around an atomic symbol, we means, it means something different, right? We say, if we put a 39 there, what does that mean? That's the mass number, right? The sum of the protons and neutrons. If I put a plus one there, that's our charge. The subscript down into the right, is how many of them we have. It's just the number of those ions. Um, and then did we did we do anything with this spot? There's one corner left of the atomic symbol. So sometimes you'll see this where uh, you'll actually write the number of protons in that bottom left corner. But that's really kind of redundant, right? Because if you know it's potassium, you already know how many protons it has. Right, so we don't really need to use that spot. So to avoid making things look even more cluttered than they already are, I'm not gonna use that. But if you do see something in that bottom left corner, that's what it's showing you, it's just number of protons. So what would the names be for these two compounds? What's the top one? Magnesium chloride. Sodium nitride. All right, so here's a slide that's got all the information on na naming ionic compounds. Again, you've already seen most of this. Um, anions, you replace the last syllable of their name with I. The few, there are some irregulars. Oxygen, it's not oxygide, it's oxide. Um, nitrogen becomes nitride, phosphorus becomes phosphide. Um, so, and, but most of the, the other ones, 
follow the same basic principle. You just drop that last that last syllable and write I instead. Uh, and for the most part, they should sound, at least this was my experience in high school, most of them kind of sounded right. You've grown up hearing a lot of these, even if you didn't know what they were saying or what it meant. meant. So if I said sulfuride or oxygide, you'd look at me like I described an extra head, right? I would, that would be a really weird thing to say. Um, everybody's heard oxide before, uh, even if you didn't know what it meant. Um, here's some more. We did we used magnesium already. What would this one be? It's not magnesium chloride. It'd be bromide. magnesium bromide. B A S E. Barium selenide. How about RBI? Rubidium iodide. And this is exactly why we it winds up being really important that we get our capitalization right. Right? If I write RBI like this, that means something very different than if I write R BI like that. Now this is a bismuth instead of instead of um, rubidium and iodide. Right, so getting the capitaliz capitalization right, this is why I was so picky about that. And I'll continue to be picky about that. Uh, here's one more example. It sounds a little bit weird. Okay, so cadmium, TE is tellurium, right? It's, you had it right, tell you right. Just like the town in Colorado. I don't know if the town in Colorado was named after Tellurium or Tellurium was named after the town in Colorado, um, but either way, it's the same. It sounds funny, especially especially when I lived in, in um, Colorado and some of my research was on cadmium telluride because it's a really common compound used in photovoltaics and solar cells. Um, so it was all, you always had to be specific when you were talking with people who worked in the solar industry. Now I'm talking about cadmium telluride, not telluride Colorado. Um, but that's just a, that one's always stuck out to be a funny, a funny one for that reason. All right. If we have things that can have multiple possible charges, like most of our transition metals, right? Close to the D block, a good chunk of the P block, Basically everything that's not the first two columns of metals and these six have multiple possible charges as a metal. So what do we do now? Roman numerals. Yeah, I gotta stop asking the question when it's already on the slide. Um, but, and so the, the trick here is that the Roman numeral is not sig signifying how many you have, it's telling you the charge. This is still the same rules for, for nomenclature. You say the name of the positive ion, then you say the name of the negative ion. It's just that now we have to specify which copper ion we're talking about. So Cu with a plus one charge is a copper one ion. And if you know your Roman numerals, use your Roman numerals when you get to some of the higher charges. If you haven't been practicing your Roman numerals, um, if you're not sure how to write it properly, just write the regular Arabic numeral. The, our regular numbers. I always like to throw that in there because usually there's a half the class hasn't hasn't heard that before. What's that? So in the name, you specify, I'm not going to test you on, do you know what the two possible charges for copper are? Now, and Brody, I was not meaning to poke fun. I, I really actually just, it's worth noting that, that the Arabic numerals are the, num are the numbers that you were taught throughout, uh, throughout school. So it's not just you. There's actually a really funny YouTube video. Um, has anybody heard of the Good Liars? Um, their, their YouTube channel, they go around and they, they interview, um, they interview people and kind of like, I, they're, they're fairly entertaining, they're political based, but they went around asking people, 
asking Trump supporters if they thought it was a good idea to teach Arabic numerals in school. Um, and uh, as you might expect, most of them were turned off by the word Arabic and said, no, we should absolutely not be teaching Arabic numerals in school. Um, so it's worth noting the number system that we use was developed in Persia in the, in the early BCE, I believe, because Roman numerals are just awful. If you've ever tried to do arithmetic with Roman numerals, it's, it's terrible. That's why they invented the abacus, because how else could you keep track of things in Roman numerals? All right, so, and to reiterate, I don't expect you to know what the possibilities are here, but if I give you a formula, I expect you to be able to work out what the charge is on that ion. And if I give you the name, I expect you to be able to use that charge to figure out what the formula should be. Is that reasonable? Okay. So copper one oxide, the copper has a plus one charge, the oxygen is still two minus. The other, so this is the other place where I'm going to tell you to be really careful, is if you're saying the, the symbols out loud, then you're saying the formula. And any numbers are referring to the subscript. If you say the word copper, you're giving the name, and now any number you say means the charge. So it's copper one oxide, or I could say Cu2O, but don't mix and match those two or you're just gonna confuse everybody, right? If you're saying the formula, you say the symbols. If you're saying the name, then it, the number refers to the charge, not how many you have, right? Just watch out for that. Um, let's see, what's another good one? So here's an example of one I wouldn't expect you to necessarily be able to um, get the uh, Roman numeral right. Chromium has a, can have a plus six charge. What's the formula of chromium six oxide going to be? So chromium is a six plus and oxygen is a two minus. CrO3. And the name, when we wrote it out, chromium six. And if you know your Roman numerals, write it. But if not, you can just write chromium six in parentheses, as long as you put it in the parentheses, I'll know what you're trying to do. So don't get your charge wrong because you don't know your Roman numerals. When in doubt, just write it like that for me. Maybe. They do. They are, it's a noun, but it's not a proper noun. So you only capitalize if it's at the beginning of a sentence. That said, it, it is always tempting, especially with the ones that are named after people, to capitalize them. You're not going to get marked wrong for that, but it's unnecessary. But now we're getting into science, I guess we call it scientific grammar. Um, and again, not something I'm going to grade you on. In fact, you can see I did it on the on the example slide right here. I capitalized them. All right, we got a whole page of practice. We're not going to go through all of these. There's a few that I want to point out though. AG2O, what's the name for that one? Silver, silver, silver oxide. Do we need a number on silver? Why not? That's one of our six in the D block that doesn't need a number because when it has a charge, it's always plus one. So we can just say silver oxide. In fact, I made it. I made a typo on here because I put cadmium two telluride. You don't actually need the two because cadmium is another one of those. When cadmium has a charge, it's always plus two, so I don't need to say two.
And then let's, we'll do one more from here. How about MN3N2? MN3N2, what's the charge on the nitrogen? What's the charge on the nitride in general? Uh, minus, three. minus three. And there's two of them. So a total of minus six. So then, and then we have three manganese. We can actually write it out as an algebra expression if we want to, or you can just think it think it through in your head. What does the charge have to be on the manganese for this to work out? This whole thing has to add up to plus six. So each of them individually would be a two plus. So manganese two nitride. Right, for these ones where there's multiple possible charges, you're, you're usually going to have to work it back that way. Look at the anions, because the anions should be a little bit more definitive usually. All right. Any other questions on anything up here? Fairly straightforward once you know the rules, right? There's the six in the first two columns. Other than that, everything, all the metals should have a, a uh, Roman numeral. So let's talk, let's talk about covalent bonds a little bit. Get into those at all before I got here. Covalent compounds a little bit. They should make a lot more sense now that we've talked about electrons and orbitals. If not, then what have we been doing? Uh, so for non-metals, non-metals are trying to gain electrons to become more stable and have a full valence, right? If you don't have any metals around or any other source of electrons, you can wind up with two non-metal atoms sharing electrons. And that makes what's called a covalent bond. Does anybody know what the root for covalent mean is from? What does covalent mean? in terms of like the etymology. What's co mean? Together. Together. What do you suppose valent means? Shells or valence. Basically covalent electrons literally means the electrons are in both valences at the same time. Basically it's a way that we're gonna be able to double count our electrons so that everything can have a full valence. I was, I think the first time I heard the word covalent, I was probably about 14, and I never questioned where that came from. I'll be honest, it took me about five years teaching chemistry before I actually put together that covalent means in both valences. Um, it was always just, oh, it's a covalent bond. I never actually thought about the word. All right, and so the, we can actually explain this energetically. If we look at the energy of a system, if you start with two hydrogen atoms, so each hydrogen atom needs to gain how many electrons to be stable? Or needs to get to a total of how many valence electrons? For hydrogen? Hydrogen only needs two, it's in that first row, right? So if hydrogen only needs two electrons to be stable, if you have two hydrogen atoms, they're naturally going to be attracted to each other because they, if they can share those electrons, both hydrogen atoms can be stable at the same time. And if you start with them at, a, at an infinite distance, you pretend there's no other matter in the universe, just these two hydrogen atoms. Even at, at a near infinite distance, they're still going to be slightly attracted to each other. Because if you, you can think about it like putting a marble on this really, really shallow slope out here. It's going to naturally roll downhill into a more stable state. Just like our electrons, when we're filling our electron configurations, naturally try to fill the lowest energy states first, right? That alpha principle. And so as you bring these two hydrogens closer together, they get more and more stable. Lower energy is more stable until something happens. 
you reach a point where your marble is just kind of sitting down here at the bottom of this surface. And that's what we call bond length. The average distance between the two atoms where the electron can be in both valences at the same time. But it seems like you could bring them closer together though, right? If we could bring these atoms even closer, then you could have even better overlap between these two, these two orbitals. So how come they just stop right here? What would happen if they got even closer? And the protons in the nucleus start repelling each other. So there's basically like a, a crossover point where we want the electrons to be as close together as possible, but if you get them too close, then the nuclei start pushing each other apart. And so you get sort of this equilibrium distance where the electrons are close enough they can be in the same valences, but far enough apart that the two nuclei aren't actively pushing each other away. If we keep getting them closer and closer together, the nuclei start pushing each other more and more. And it kind of looks like an asymptote. Oh, it's not a true asymptote though. Because what would happen if we got these things really, really close together? What happens if you take two atoms and you get them really so close together that their nuclei touch? It's called fusion, exactly. So it actually would get more stable, again, if we got really, really close. But at this point, we're just looking at electromagnetic forces. We're not looking at nuclear forces yet. All right, so it turns out that when we, when we make these covalent bonds, we can make these covalent bonds any way we want as long as all the valences get filled. And that means that there's more than one possible stable compound you can make, more than one possible ratio. And so that's why we use different nomenclature rules for covalent compounds than ionic compounds because you can have H2O or you can have H2O2. We can't just say hydrogen and oxide because hydrogen and oxide doesn't tell you what ratio they're in. Both of these are stable compounds, or relatively. CO is a stable compound and so is CO2. Right, so this is where those Greek prefixes come in. We wouldn't just say carbon oxide, we specify by using those prefixes how many carbons and how many oxygens. So what is the name for this compound? Carbon dioxide versus carbon monoxide or monooxide. We don't usually, we usually abbreviate it. If we wind up with that by adding a mono to the front, we usually just turn that into one O. So it doesn't look like carbon monoxide. But again, if you wrote it like that, I wouldn't mark you down. All right. So how do we know what these different compounds, I guess let's look at, let's skip and do the nomenclature first since we already talked about nomenclature. If you've got a covalent compound with only two compounds, or with only two elements, we just name it by saying how many of everything there is. Just like we already demonstrated. We don't say mono for the first element typically, just out of convention, whatever you, element you say first is assumed that you have one of it, of that element, unless you specify otherwise. So we wouldn't say monocarbon monoxide. It would just be carbon monoxide. We wouldn't say monocarbon dioxide, it would just be carbon dioxide. What would be, if we use those, those uh, prefixes, what would the name for water actually be? Dihydrogen monoxide. Dihydrogen monoxide. Why don't I just switch the order and write OH2 and then I could just say oxygen, why not? It, it sounds silly. Basically, whatever is, got, is closer up into the right is better at pulling electrons towards itself, right? At the higher ionization energy, higher electronegativity. 
So whatever is closer to fluorine, get it goes at the end of our covalent compound usually and gets the I suffix. So we wouldn't say oxygen dihydride because oxygen is more electronegative. So oxygen is more likely to have a negative charge. Jesse? So fluorine, never go first. so fluorine will never go first. If fluorine is in something, in a compound, fluorine is the last thing written. So you can even have some, there's some compounds where you can make, um, where you can get noble gases to form a compound if you put them with fluorine, because fluorine is so reactive. But we naming this is pretty straightforward though. We just say whatever, in this case, xenon tetrafluoride. So here's our list of Greek prefixes. Mono, di, then what? Tri, then tetra. Penta, hexa, hepta, octa, nona, and deca. They go past that, but we're gonna we're not gonna name anything with more than ten of a specific atom. We're not gonna name any of them this way. So this would just be xenon tetrafluoride. Most of these you've probably seen before. Tetra was new to me when I first learned it. The rest of them were all look familiar. You know, my, my instinct was instead of tetra to write quad or something like that. That's actually a Latin prefix. Tetra means four in Greek. Um, and interestingly enough, who's played Tetris before? It's where Tetris gets its name. Tetris gets all of the pieces in Tetris are four blocks arranged differently. And I don't know if this was just my high school, but we had one on our TI-83s at the time. We could put games on them because we didn't have smartphones back in the in the old days. Um, and Tetris was the was the you know one that was the highest demand. We called getting clearing four rows with one piece. We called that getting a Tetris. I don't know if that's an official term or if that was just my high school, but because you cleared, cleared four rows at once, Tetra. Now there's no need to put games on your calculators because you just have phones. And phones are better at games than calculators are anyway. It was the dark ages, it was truly. All right, did you talk about diatomic molecules yet? Okay. That answers the question. So if you put a bunch of non-metals together, they're gonna to naturally form covalent bonds because non-metals don't have full valences. So to become more stable, they naturally are gonna try and share electrons. And that means even when they're in their pure state, these certain non-metal elements, actually all non-metal elements in their pure state will form covalent bonds. Um, the most common of these are called diatomic elements. It's basically everything on the periodic table that's a gas at room temperature is going to be a diatomic molecule. So Cl2, we wouldn't say dichloride. We would just call that chlorine. These are all the pure elemental states of these compounds naturally form these molecules because that's a way that you can get everything to have a full valence and be stable at the same time and still have it be in its pure state. So, and it's basically column 17, so fluorine down, and then nitrogen, oxygen, and hydrogen. And they, nat they naturally form these compounds. So when you have hydrogen gas, you don't just have hydrogen, you have H2. So when it comes to naming these, if I asked you to name any of these, you wouldn't say dibromine, you would just say bromine. And because you actually, it actually takes a lot more energy to get bromine into what they, they actually specify. If you have a bromine atom by itself, that's called atomic bromine. Because you actually have to put more energy in to get it to split up like that. All right, so the more common state is if you just say bromine, it's assumed to be Br2. 
I just say oxygen, it's assumed to be O2. The rest of the nonmetals also form covalent bonds, but they're mostly solids at room temperature, and their bonds wind up being much larger um, compounds than just diatomic. Diatomics, really easy to see why they're called diatomic, right? Two atoms. Um, sulfur, phosphorus, carbon, boron, silicon, they also make covalent bonds in their pure state but they're more complicated. Sulfur can actually make two different, two or three different um, forms. You can have sulfur, you can have S4, or you can have S8, or you can have S12. And we don't actually name these as diatomic or just, we just call it for the most part, we just say sulfur as a solid, even though really it makes these molecules like this. Um, carbon's the same way. You can have carbon. What are the two solid forms of carbon? Of pure carbon. When you have pure carbon, what do you get? Diamonds or graphite or anthracite. So we sometimes will specify carbon diamond or carbon graphite. We, we don't really put a number behind it unless there's some specific thing going on. Has anybody ever heard of a buckyball? Buckyball looks like a molecular a molecular soccer ball. That thing, there's a buckyball right there, thank you. That's also a solid form of carbon um, that has its own name. That most of those are C60. There's about 60 carbon atoms in that molecule if that's a standard size buckyball, which it looks like it is. All right, and then anybody know what the pure forms of phosphorus are called? They're named after colors. Red phosphorus, white phosphorus, orange is a good guess. Um, red, red phosphorus and white phosphorus are the common, common forms. You can also can get it um, as black phosphorus or violet phosphorus, but those are less common. And those are all, they're all pure elements. And so that's why, but we don't really specify what, how many of them there are in each of those. They just have a slightly different crystal structure. So if it mattered for a specific reaction, we would write it as phosphorus white or something like that. It's not something I'm going to quiz on. White phosphorus gets all the attention in the media because it gets used in, you know, war crimes and things like that. Um, if you've seen like those um, tracer rounds they use in uh, in machine guns, those a lot of times there's a, or there's a way to do it that's humane, but if you use white phosphorus in your tracer rounds, it causes like these really really nasty burns um, around the bullet wounds that cause you know lots of suffering and things like that. Um, that's one of the things that both Israel and Syria were accused of using on each other um, at various points in the last couple decades. Um, so white phosphorus has that is most commonly most commonly will hear that term like that. Red phosphorus is what you see in in um, matchbooks. That red strip that you strike the match on is red phosphorus. All right, so that's just the main thing that you need to know as far as nomenclature for this class is these diatomics. So basically it's column 17 and the rest of the gases at room temperature, sorry, aside from the noble gases. I always forget to exclude those because they're boring. All right, did you do Lewis dot structures with Tom's? Yes. Not, this Not this year, yeah. but you have in the past. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Not, all of us have taken. Not all of us have taken it, right? All right, so. So a Lewis dot structure, bring it back. 
A Lewis dot structure is just a way to represent where the electrons are and how many bonds you need to form to fill a valence. Basically, if, if we have um, a series of, of atoms that have an open spot in their valence, like let's say we had two fluorine atoms, each fluorine atom is trying to gain one electron to become stable, right? They, each fluorine has one vacancy. So if you bring the two fluorines up close to each other, those two partially filled orbitals can overlap and you get an electron from the left-hand fluorine and an electron from the right-hand fluorine being shared between the two fluorines, which we represent with a single line. A line, when we're drawing chemical bonds, represents two electrons, not one because you have to have one electron from each atom in order for this to work, for the most part. You know me, I can't use an absolute. It usually works like that. All right, so that means that looking at the number of vacancies in an atom's valence shell will tell you how many bonds that element would usually form when it makes covalent bonds. So all of our of column 17 has one vacancy, right? So we'd expect all of column 17, fluorine, chlorine, and so on, to make a single bond, just like it's drawn here. What other element, there's one other element that has a single vacancy that's not drawn in column 17? Hydrogen, which is why some periodic tables, I don't think the ones taped to your desk have, that have it like this. There are some periodic tables that put hydrogen in both places. They'll put hydrogen in column one and, and put hydrogen in column 17 next to helium. Because hydrogen really can do one of two things. It can either lose an electron like sodium or it can gain an electron like fluorine. But other than that, everything else is gonna have multiple vacancies, which means what? How many vacancies does oxygen have? So I guess let's back it up. How many valence electrons for oxygen? These six valence electrons, which means two vacancies. So it can, if we added, we brought two hydrogen atoms up close to it, you could make water. What if we brought another oxygen up close? We could make an, have an oxygen make a bond with another oxygen, right? And then if we added our two hydrogens, we could get something that looked like kind of like water. You could actually make something, this is a stable compound. It's not H2O though, it's what? H2O2, which is hydrogen peroxide, dihydrogen dioxide, but hydrogen peroxide is a common name for it. This is just that, I can't say this is just as stable as water. This is also a stable compound made of just hydrogen and oxygen, which is why we have to use these prefixes to specify how many of everything we have. All right, let's try, what do we do? Well, it's up there. There are some compounds where you don't have enough electrons based on the atoms that you have. If we have CO2, how many total valence electrons do we have? CO2, Carbon's got four, and then we have two oxygens that each have six electrons, right? Valence electrons. So 12 and another four is a total of 16 valence electrons. Well, if I just start by putting carbon in the middle and surrounding it by oxygen, we can make some bonds 
but we don't actually don't have enough electrons to fill all of the valences. How many electrons have I used so far? I have 16 to work with. I've only used four of them, right? Because each of these bonds represents two electrons. So we have 12 electrons left. Well, how many is each, the way it's drawn, how many does each oxygen still need? An additional six would get us each oxygen to a total of eight, right? But that's gonna use up, so when I have non-bonding electrons, a lot of times I do it like this so that I can draw, so that you can see them, so that you don't miss those little dots. It does look a little bit like a flower. How many electrons have I used now? All of them. Does everything have a full valence? The oxygens are both set, but the carbon's not, right? So carbon still needs another four electrons. When we wind up using, if we use all of our electrons, but we still haven't filled all the valences yet, we start making double or triple bonds. We basically say, okay, well, these oxygens are stable, but the carbon's not. So I'm gonna take away two of those electrons and I'm gonna make the oxygen share some more. Are we stable yet? Nope. Not quite. What do we need to do? Do that again to the other side. Now we've still used a total of 16 electrons. We're just double bonded now. And now everything has a full valence. Each oxygen has eight electrons. The carbon has eight electrons. Everything's stable here. And this goes back to, you want to know how many bonds each of the elements is likely to make? Look at how many vacancies it has. Oxygen has two vacancies, right? Oxygen typically is going to be most stable when it makes two bonds. Carbon has four vacancies. It's typically going to be most stable when it has four bonds. All right, so let me jump back a second. So here's our, our general process for writing, for drawing a Lewis, any Lewis dot structure. You place the atom with the most bonds or the most vacancies, the more universal way to say this, you put the atom with the lowest electronegativity in the middle. Remember, most electronegative is fluorine, right? The closer you get to fluorine, the more electronegative something is. Electronegativity is a stand-in for how well does it share. So if it doesn't share very well, are we ever going to put it in the middle? Not really. It's not going to be very stable like that. So if we have to choose what goes in the middle, it's usually going to be whatever has the lowest electronegativity. So in this case, we're talking about water. Right away, we're going to come up against an exception here because can hydrogen go in the middle? How many bonds is hydrogen going to make? One. Just one. So if something only makes one bond, by definition, could it ever be in the middle? No, because if it can only make one bond, you can't put it in the middle. It has to be at the end. So in this case, even though hydrogen is less electronegative than oxygen, we're going to put oxygen in the middle. It has more vacancies than hydrogen. Can make more bonds. And then we're going to put our hydrogens on either side. Then we're going to total up our valence electrons. So in this case, oxygen has how many valence electrons? Oxygen's got six, each hydrogen has one. So we have a total of eight valence electrons. Right? And we're just going to arrange them. We're going to start by drawing a bond here between the middle atom and the outer, outer atoms. How many electrons did I use? Uh, Two pairs. So yeah, so a total of four. So now we have four electrons left. 
the way I do this, I just always keep a running tally of how many electrons do I have left. And then I just cross it out as I add electrons. Four electrons left. Where am I going to put them? Yeah, they're both going to go to the oxygen because how many electrons does hydrogen need to be stable? Just two. Both hydrogens are already stable. As soon as you make one bond, hydrogen's good. Oxygen still needed two more pairs of electrons to get to a total of eight electrons. All right, so our criteria for if it's a valid rest, uh, Lewis dot structure is... Did you use the right number of electrons? That's the most important thing. You can't be making electrons up out of nowhere. And then the second most important criteria is, did you fill all the valences? There's a third criteria we're gonna add in a little bit, uh, but for now, that's all there is to Lewis dot structures. And if you wind up with a case, I guess, quick point, does it matter which side I draw those, those uh, we call these lone pairs, these non-bonding pairs of electrons? Does it matter where I draw them? My example on the board put the hydrogens 90, deg 90 degrees from each other. And this example has them 180 degrees from each other. Does that matter? Why not? It doesn't really matter. It turns out if we want to look at this as a three-dimensional molecule, these are equivalent because the, it's going to naturally arrange itself in a shape where everything is next door to everything else. Okay. We call it tetrahedral shape, which we will not get to today. We'll talk about those geometries because, you know, chemistry is not complicated enough, so let's bring geometry into it too. All right, and again, double or triple bonds form when there's not enough electrons to complete all of the octets. If you can't complete all of the valences, there's that word again, octet. Has everybody seen Back to the Future? Yes. All right, we're, we're to the point where we're not really going to, I'm not going to start a new topic right now, so story time. My, my two-year-old is learning to talk. And uh, he's start when anytime he can't do anything, um, he's started to say it's too heavy. Uh, so like he can't get his arm out of his shirt. Oh, it's too heavy, Dad. I need help. So uh, start if you've seen Back to the Future, that word heavy comes up a lot in Back to the Future. Oh, yeah. So I've started pulling out my Doc Brown impersonation every time he says this. There's that word again. Anybody remember that? Oh, that's heavy, Doc. There's that word again. Is there something wrong with Earth's magnetic field? <laughs> No, go watch, go rewatch Back to the Future. That's not, he doesn't understand. Yeah, never mind. I'm not going to explain it. All right, here's some practice, but I think on a Friday afternoon, we've covered enough today. Sorry, I take it back one last thing, just for a second, just for a second. This is the list of polyatomic ions that will be on the quiz a week from Tuesday. Okay? We'll practice with them next week. The slides are online, so you can get that. I'll also post a PDF just of these. It's, it's still, it's less than 118, right? So it's better than the periodic table. All right. Go ahead and pack up. Stick around to the bell ring, though, please.